everyone, welcome into another edition of the GSMC College Football Podcast brought to you by GSMC Sports Network. I'm your host, as always, Tommy Brzee. It is Wednesday, October 2nd around here, and we have a great show for you today. It is absolutely packed because this upcoming weekend is absolutely packed. We have a number of games that really are all on the same level, at least in my mind. So I have six to break down today, I have about seven to break down tomorrow. So it's going to be a busy couple of days here, but we're going to start with the big-time Big Ten matchups of the week. Ohio State, Iowa, uh, Michigan-Washington, a little bit of a finals rematch from a year ago. Rutgers at Nebraska is the other one that I want to break down in the first segment. Then we got a good Friday Night Lights slate this upcoming weekend. We have TCU at Houston, which is a little bit under the radar, but definitely going to be a really fun game over there. Then we got Oregon at uh, Michigan State. Oregon takes another step up in competition i'll give my pick for that game and then syracuse unlv the absolute show of this this friday night going to be really really fun to see if the running rebels can keep their streak going and beat a third power four team on the year then we'll get to some upset alerts around the country frankly i have six right here I could have about 12 on this list. There are so many different places that things could go a little bit awry for a lot of these teams, so we'll break down my top six, but definitely some more that I would be watching out for if I were you. Then we'll get to some players and coaches under big-time pressure going into this week. I think the biggest two are definitely in that game down there in College Station. And then we'll finish it off with some questions uh, coming into week six. I think one of the biggest ones is how does Ole Miss's O-line bounce back against a really, really good pass rush against South Carolina? So a lot to get into. But before we jump in, I do want to remind you all we get tons of questions and comments throughout the show, and the best way for you all to get your question on the screen is to use that Super Chat feature on the Sports Network page. Go to the bottom of that chat, click on the dollar sign, add any question, comment you'd like, and we can have a fun back and forth. Definitely want this to be as interactive as possible. Would love for this to be as much y'all show it as, as it is mine. So definitely utilize that. GSMCpodcast.net is also up and running, does the exact same thing. So either of those that you'd like to use, you're more than welcome to. And we can have a little bit of back and forth here. But let's get into this because we got three games to break down really quickly. And then we got three more in the next segment. So going to be a busy show, no two ways about that. But I want to start with a huge game that's going on in Columbus, Ohio this upcoming weekend. And It's the first time Ohio State's really going to have their feet put to the fire. I understand Michigan State is a solid team, and they took care of them last week, but the reality is Iowa has much more to kind of throw at Ohio State, especially on the defensive side of the ball, than Michigan State did, and I think there's going to be a number of things that are going to go into this, and I think the biggest thing that we're watching for, obviously, with that great Iowa defense is just how well can Ohio State execute this offense, and then Iowa on the other side you got to be able to run the ball. you got to be able to slow this clock down and keep that offense on the sideline. But some players to watch in this one. Caleb Johnson started talking this week. He's talking about how if he got an offer from Ohio State, he probably wouldn't have committed. He just wants to beat them. He is from Ohio, has a little bit more energy going into this one, and they badly need him in this one. If they do not get him going, might as well wrap it up. This one is not going to be anywhere close if they cannot get this guy going. And he's pretty easy to get going, to be totally fair. A very dangerous player and one of those guys that could just take over on Saturday and become a household name. Then you got Nick Jackson, a linebacker that is going to have his hands full. Really, really good run back, running backs on Ohio State. Obviously, they utilize that quarterback run game with Will Howard. If those linebackers, him as well as Jay Higgins, can stand up in big-time ways, this is a team that possibly could stop this Ohio State offense and make this a little bit of a dogfight. Then we got Carnell Tate on the other side. I think we talk about Jeremiah Smith and Mecca Buka, all of these big-time players for them, but Carnell Tate is the one that I think makes all of it kind of fit together. Obviously, you love having Jeremiah Smith. Obviously, Mecca Buka is an incredible player, I think Carnell Tate gives them a little bit of more completeness on the offensive side of the ball, and I think they're going to need that on Saturday with Iowa probably selling out to stop the run and just living with the consequences of the pass game. You're going to need plenty of guys to step up on Saturday. And then you got Ty Hamilton. He's holding down the middle of that defense, the defensive tackle for Ohio State, and we know what Iowa's going to do. He's going to have to be able to handle this offensive line and get Caleb Johnson on the ground, and if they let him get past that first uh, level of the defense— Things get sketchy in a hurry when you're trying to deal with uh, Caleb Johnson. But some keys to the game, rushing offense. We've talked about it. Iowa 6th in the country, over 250 yards. Ohio State 11th in the country, 227. So these are elite rushing offenses, and that's what they're going to do. Chip Kelly has been known to be a uh, rushing offense type guy. Iowa just can't throw the ball. Cade McNamara has not been remotely good against the Power 4 opponents or the FBS opponents that he's played this year. So they're going to have to run the ball. If they can't do that, then... 
it's going to be a nightmare for really both of these sides if they can't uh, stop the run against these teams. And then the defensive attack, you know, obviously the run is going to be a big part of this, but Phil Parker's on the other sideline, one of the best play callers in the entire country, either side of the ball, does not matter. And Will Howard is still someone that's getting a little bit used to this offense. He's still not fully up to speed. Maybe Iowa can heat him up a little bit, take advantage of a couple of mistakes, and maybe they can take one back to the house and change this game in a hurry. And then you got wide receiver DB matchup. This is a really good back end for Iowa. They have, obviously, Sebastian Castro, obviously, Xavier Nwankpa, but Quinn Schul- uh, Schult, excuse me, and Deshaun Lee have played really, really well this this season. And then you just got nightmares on the other side. You got Jeremiah Smith, you got Emeka Buka, Carnell Tate, Brendan Ennis, a million guys that you're going to have to keep track of, and it's going to be a nightmare to do so, frankly, I think it's going to be nearly impossible to do so. I think Ohio State wins this one pretty comfortably, keeps moving on about their season, and then you got the big one next week. But I do think they get a big-time win. I think it's maybe a little bit of a slow start for them, but they find it uh, late in the second quarter and then continue on and get a big-time win here. Another one to watch is Rutgers at 4 p.m. on Saturday, and this one's going to be awesome. This is a huge game for both of these teams because Rutgers could take their title hopes, their CFP hopes to that next level. They've beaten a number of big-time teams. They've gotten some big wins. This is another step up. There's no two ways about that. Obviously, a big-time win over uh, Virginia Tech gives you a little bit of confidence. Going into Nebraska is a totally different ball game. So you're going to have to be able to handle this. And then Nebraska needs this one. If they want to stay at all in the fight for the Big Ten, they badly need this one uh, to go their way. And they're favored in it, so we'll see what happens. But Demir Miller is someone I want to talk about here for a second because this wide receiver for Rutgers makes this team kind of whole. I think you talk about Rutgers, it's always Kyle Mondegai, Sam Brown the fifth, and it should be, to be totally fair, but you're going to have to stretch out this Nebraska defense. They're going to be able to stop the run if you hand them the run every single time. So they're going to have to stretch the ball out, and Demir Williams is really one of the only guys that can do it. And then we have Desmond Igbenosan on the other side. Nebraska is probably going to have to throw the ball as well. There's kind of a battle of two, uh, a movable object against a unstoppable force because they're going to run the ball and they're just going to figure out who quits first. Desmond Igbenosan needs to make sure that they can't get that big play downfield, that they can't find Isaiah Nair or Jamal Banks down the field, and then maybe Rutgers has a much better shot to win this one. And he's going to see a lot of Isaiah Nair. This has become kind of uh, Dylan Raiola's favorite target throughout the year. Definitely a really long, athletic kid that can do a number of things on the football field. If you let him get deep a couple of times in this game, I'm not sure Rutgers has the firepower to come back in one of these. And then you got Nash Huttmacher. He is an absolute monster. This is a guy that can just eat space, as you can see, to be totally fair. He's someone that can absolutely dominate the line of scrimmage and can take over this game and maybe just take... Uh, Kyle Monagai totally out of this one. But some keys to the game. Control the line of scrimmage. We talked about it early on. They're going to run the ball. That's the way these teams go about business. Uh, Rutgers a little bit more aggressively so than, uh, than Nebraska, obviously. But it's going to be a game where it's decided in the trenches decidedly. There's no two ways about that. Whoever wins this battle, the offensive line versus the defensive line, is going to win this game. And then you got quarterback comfort. This is a very interesting matchup because you have one veteran, one very young player, but you have one guy on the road, you have one guy at home. Whoever can get their quarterback a little bit more comfortable, if they can get Riola to play that elite football that he's been playing all year, Ethan Kaliak Manis, if he can take that next little step forward in this big time game, then that's probably going to be a huge difference maker because as they're running the ball, as they're pounding the rock inside, one big play can change this game in a hurry. And then outside noise is a very interesting one going into this one because Rutgers is undefeated. They're playing really good football. They're decidedly an underdog in this game. And frankly, I probably agree with that sentiment, but it's going to be one of those games that maybe Rutgers just shows up with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because of that, or maybe Nebraska has a little bit of chip on their shoulder from the Illinois game. So there's plenty of noise going into this one, but I'm going to go Nebraska. It's one of those games that I've gone back and forth on a number of different times. I don't feel necessarily great either way, but I do think Nebraska being at home is the difference. I think they felt what that Illinois game was, and I don't think they're going to make that same mistake again. To be fair, they don't win a lot of one-possession games, so we'll see what happens here. But it's definitely one of those games that could go either way and is going to define the Big 12 in quite some ways uh, down the stretch of the season. And then we get a little bit of a rematch from last year's championship game. Cannot wait for Michigan to head out to Washington, and yes, that is the line for this game. Washington is favored by three points, and very, very weird, obviously. Michigan being a top 10 team in the country, but I don't necessarily disagree with the sentiment. I think when you look at Michigan right now, there's not really much to be excited about offensively. And you look at what Washington is, 
I think they just have to hit that one big game. They have to play that one game where they play B plus football and they can possibly win this one and then things get really interesting because they've had a really tough year. There's no two ways about that. Beating the team that ended your year last year is going to make fans feel a lot better about what this year is for Washington. As for players to watch, Samaj Morgan is going to be huge pretty much for the rest of the year for Michigan. He's the guy that you can get it out on the edge on a screen. He's the guy that you can possibly run an end around, run a jet sweep, get him out on the edge, and let him do what makes him special, which is his speed. So he's one of those guys that when you don't have a passing attack, sometimes you just need one of those guys that can win after the catch. And that's definitely one of these guys. So got to make sure that he gets the ball early and gets going early. And then Josiah Stewart. He might have been the star of the uh, USC game, just an absolute monster off the edge that terrorized Miller Moss for much of that game. He could do the exact same thing here, and then Will Rogers is not going to be able to get anything going. Much like, I mean, even less than Miller Moss was able to. And I thought Miller Moss played a really good game, but at the end of the day, did not necessarily get going the way that he wanted to in that one. So maybe Josiah Stewart has the same fate for Will Rogers in mind. Then you got Denzel Boston on the other side. This is a huge wide receiver for Washington, and one of those guys that Washington's not going to be able to win this game in a rock fight. There's no way. They're going to have to be able to go over the top a couple of times, and if you avoid Will uh, Johnson, you have a pretty good chance to get over top. I think uh, Michigan's back end is solid. I think they're good. I don't think they're quite at the level that they need to be, and I think as long as you avoid that number two, you have a shot to make some big-time plays. And then you got Sebastian Valdez. The line of scrimmage is obviously going to be very important. Michigan's going to try to run the ball. They're going to try to wear this team down. The linebackers will help with this a lot, but you got to set the point of attack. If you're getting pushed off the ball three, four yards every single play, it's going to be a really long day, and you're going to lose by about 20 points. So definitely something that he's going to have to have a huge game for, and if he doesn't, then Michigan's going to roll in this one. Keys to the game, the opening script in this one is huge. Washington has yet to score on their opening drive. Michigan has yet to give up points on their opening drive. The reality is Washington kind of needs it. They cannot play from behind in this game because Michigan will just bury you. That's the way that they've gone about business. Obviously, gave up a little bit of a lead to Minnesota, a little bit of a lead to USC, but this is a team that can win the game when it matters. And especially for Washington... I don't know if they're on the level of what USC is. I don't think they can possibly take that punch and then get back up from it. So got to score early. Maybe not on the opening drive, but make sure that you get the first points on the board because then it could get sketchy in a hurry if you don't. And then linebacker play. You have Carson Bruner, Tupatala, excuse me, on the other side. They're going to have their hands full with those Michigan running backs. And then you got Jonah Coleman on the other side. It's not like it gets a ton easier for Jay Sean Barham and Ernest Howman, both really talented players. I think this could be where Washington's strength is, those linebackers in. Maybe that's exactly what they need in this game. And then that rematch energy. There's no two ways about that. Washington is going to be mad coming into this one. It's a lot of new people. No two ways about that. A whole new coaching staff. But Carson Bruner knew what that felt like. Denzel Boston knew what that felt like. Giles Jackson knew what that felt like. And they're going to come into this one with their hair on fire. I absolutely promise you that. The thing is, I just don't think they can do enough. I don't love this Washington offense. I don't think they're going to be able to get much of anything going against this Michigan defense. And I think Will Rogers is going to make a couple of mistakes in this game that's going to define it. So I am picking Michigan. Frankly, I don't feel great about it either way. I think it's one of those games that is going to totally a toss-up in the air, and we'll see what happens, but I am going to pick Michigan just by a hair in that one. Definitely going to be a really fun game, and we'll see who can come out on top for a rematch of that championship from a year ago. But let's take our first break here, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the Friday Night Lights. we got three more games for you, so we're going to roll through that really quickly right after this, so stick with us.